Edwin and welcome back to What To Do. Without wasting too much time, we're at the Curry Aviation Museum. There's a lot of planes behind me. I really want to check those out. So let's go inside and find somebody to talk to. Okay, so now we are here with Dick Briggs. So would you be able to tell us a little bit more about your role with the museum? Okay, I've been a board member for about five years. I'm the webmaster and we have a Wednesday work crew. I'm very uh, involved with that. And uh, jack of all trades and master of none. So, but we're all, we're a, a all volunteer group out here. No salaried people. So. That's so cool that you volunteer so much of your time to this museum. So, based off what I have just seen, just walking into this museum, it seems like a super cool place with a lot of history. Could you tell us a little bit more about the museum and some of the history behind the museum? Okay, this is our 40th year, so we'll be promoting uh, the 40th year all the way through our summer events. Uh, on the third Saturday of each month, we have what we call Open Cockpit Day. This is where we have a lot of ex-pilots. Uh, when we go out to the outside, I'll show you some of the planes that students can actually sit in and pretend to be a pilot. Okay, uh, but uh, the, the first plane we had was a DC-3, and it, uh, we sold it. And it's up in Alaska now, uh, being rehab, and it was actually was flying, but then a the storm did some damage, but they're going to get it operational again. So it's an old DC-3. Okay, what we're standing in now is kind of what we call the kids section. We've got the, um, the simulator back here. And actually, we're going to have a scout project look at uh, revamping this for us this summer. So uh, we've had last year, we had a, uh, another Eagle Scout that did the painting of all the uh, viewing stands. Behind, uh, over here behind the cameraman is our little kids play area. And over here we have our astronaut thing that the kids love getting their photos in it. And over here we have the uh, control panels of an A7. So this is the World War II version of it. You can't see that, can you? No, but I can see it. Okay, down here. Okay, this is the, the World War II version, and this is what we have outside that, that was flew in Vietnam. So you can see the difference of all the controls that uh, a pilot has to learn. Wow, this is super cool. This museum seems like a great spot for everyone. They have stuff for kids, so much history to learn about and read about, so it's great for college students, kids, or f anyone. Okay, we're updating this section here to become all of our World War II uh, displays. But over here we have the model of the Nola Gay, actually signed by the pilot, uh, Tippett, and the navigator. And remember, the Nola Gay was the first plane that dropped the atomic bomb over Hiroshima. Our link trainer, this is how pilots learn how to fly instrument uh, flying. So they would put the pilot in there, close the door, turn the lights off, they'd have controls. Over here, the uh, operator would tell them how to, what their target was. And the old computer stuff, they would map it out, uh, see if they passed the test or not. And it uh, all worked on bellows like an organ because the guy who developed it was an organ uh, person. So he used bellows to simulate the movement. Mm -hmm. Okay, over here we have an engine that was actually built in Bloomington in 1920, 1918. And uh, it was in competition because they needed engines for World War I that was coming up. So it made, uh, they had to pass a 100 hour test. It blew up at 75, but we've re redesigned it. Okay, this is how we got it. And this is what it looks like now. So our team is good at restoring stuff. Okay, this is our Glacier Girl. It was a 1942 where the weather was really bad, so they had to land on the glacier in, uh, in Iceland. And they had to walk seven days out to be rescued. And 50 years later, somebody said, let's go find it. So they did. Well, glaciers move and a lot of snow, so it was buried under the uh, ice and snow about uh, 250 feet. But they actually uh, tunneled down with uh, hot water uh, pressure hoses, took it apart piece by piece, brought it back up, and it's back now in flying condition. So this is one of our uh, members built the, uh, the model of this. This is one of our inside uh, engine cutaways. Our engineers from uh, Caterpillar just love looking at this thing, figuring that this was all done by hand drawing and slide rule and stuff like that. Now they have CAD systems, but it's very complex. It's a uh, Wright uh, R3350 duplex cyclone, 
and there's six of them on what they have on the B-36D Peacemaker. So six of these monsters were on that, pl that uh, flew that plane. Okay, this is one of our highlights that this helicopter, everyone is welcome to sit in. So it's part of an open cockpit day, and then of, even on the weekends we have the Huey open. Being a Marine, I did not fly in the, the Huey. I flew in the CH-34 uh, off the USS Okinawa, and the CH-46 is kind of like the uh, CH-47 Chinook, and then also I got one right on the Jolly Green Giant, the CH-53. But here, this, the Huey, the UH stands for Utility Helicopter, as you can see, he's sitting in here. So troop transport, they have seats, but most of the time they took the seats out and about eight to ten soldiers would sit in there. The helicopter would hit the LZ, they'd jump out, and the helicopter would take off. We have uh, two pilots actually work with us on our open cockpit day. They both served in Vietnam. They also use it for medevacs and carrying supplies. That's why it's a utility helicopter. It can do many things. If you go out to our website, prairieaviationmuseum.org, you'll find that we have three planes that were in the actual first Top Gun movie. The first one here is our T-38. It's a, the T stands for training. If you paint that black with a red star on the tail, that was a Russian MiG-28 in the first Top Gun movie. Remember when he, the uh, Maverick flew upside down and gave him the bird? Mm -hmm. This was the black bird. Okay, this is our Marine Corps Air uh, Sea Cobra, and it was a gunship where the Huey, uh, Huey was a uh, troop transport. This was an actual gunship. The gunner would sit in the front, the pilot would sit in the back in a ray seat. The gunner, he had a special helmet. Every time he was turning his head, the Gatling gun would rotate. So if he turned left, his head left, so were the Gatling gun, up and down, left and right. So unique weaponry. This is the F-4 Phantom. This was a real workhorse in Vietnam. It was twice the speed of sound. They started out not having a uh, Gatling gun on it because they thought every air battles would be done with rockets. Well, in Vietnam, the shot down ratio was two MiGs, four Phantoms. So they started Top Gun. So we have three planes out here, but this is a fourth one that uh, was not in the movie. But let's go up here to the, uh, the viewing stand, and I'll give you some uh, history on the names. The pilot was Son McCune, called Muggs, and the Rio, which is a uh, radar intercept officer, he sat in the back. He ran all the controls and the weapons and the radar. So anyway, these guys, they were in a, a dogfight, uh, seven, seven bigs and two phantoms. Well, they were one of the f only uh, three teams that shot down two MiGs in one day. So uh, because of his uh, piloting skills, and he actually, in Top Gun, they hit the air brake. And this, this, in real, he actually did a somersault with this plane to get the MiG off of his tail. Months later, he was promoted as the first commander of Top Gun. So we have some history here. Now, Jack, Jack Inch, who is called uh, Fingers, was an ISU graduate, and, uh, and he grew up in Springfield. So we have some local history here. So ISU, Springfield, and they got the Navy Cross for their uh, heroics that day. This is our A-7 Corsair. It's a uh, Navy plane. Uh, it landed, it was a carrier base, so you can see in the back there, that that's the tail hook. So when they land, they catch that uh, wire, and that's how they stop. So they're going about 200 miles an hour, and they hit the hook, and they stop in about uh, 30 yards. So 200 mile an hour down to zero in about 30 yards. Okay, this is one of my favorite planes because its cousin kind of saved our uh, company one, one day. And if you go out to our website under my story, under my name, Dick Briggs, you'll see my story about this here. But Anyway, we had a, uh, a full day battle. Uh, we had uh, 22 Marines killed that day in our company. And as we were setting up our night perimeter, I was supposed to go back to the command post, get the instructions for passwords and stuff like that. As I was walking out back toward the line, I saw this plane. Who could miss that ugly face? Well, the A-7 was after my time, but the cousin was the Crusader came in, all I have about a five second video movie in my mind, 
came down, dropped a ton of bombs on it, and it was real close. I thought it was so close it hit my squad, but they didn't. But we did not hear any gunfire the rest of the night. So that's one of the saving graces of air power in a, in a war for the uh, grunts. Okay, this is our Marine Corps A-4 Skyhawk. And it's, uh, the name up here is Captain David Wilson. His nickname is Titan because he was a Illinois Wesleyan graduate. So another local history. Not I as you, but uh, we're friends. So, but uh, it's a single uh, seater. So he had to do everything. He had to fly it, do all the weapons control, uh, evasive flying for uh, against weapons. So everything, he was a uh, single fighter. <laughs> so... But the A stands for assault. Okay, the F4 that we just talked about, the F is for fighter. So again, alphabet soup. T for trainer, F for fighter, A for assault. And this is one of our top, or one of our three top gun planes. So you think about Jasper and Viper. This is what they flew as the uh, enemy attack on the F4 Tom Cruise. But not the F-4, the F-14, I'm sorry. Let's go around and see his uh, counter, counter uh, jet. This is our F-14 Tomcat, the Top Gun movie with uh, Maverick and Goose. Here we have Maeve sitting in the starboard intake. Look how big this plane is, and it was carrier-based. We'll walk around it here and so you can get the actual size. But during the... Uh, open cockpit days, you can sit in where Maeve is sitting. Okay, this plane here, the F-14, actually flew into the Bloomington Airport and got demilitarized to be in our air park. It is the only static F-14 in the state of Illinois that you can go up and touch. So come on out and see. This is the favorite of, the, of all the planes out here with the F-14 Tomcat. The tail section of the F-14, just to kind of give you an idea how big this baby is, Let's go look at the rear engines. Okay, in the tank over here, we have a, one of the first versions of the engine that actually fit into the F-14. But look at the wide span of where the engines are. And in the movie, remember the flare out, look at the tension and the torque that would happen when one engine would go out, the other one's going full speed. And you heard uh, Goose say, you gonna do what? And Cruz said, I'm gonna hit the air brake. The red thing up here is the air brake. That's where he would, able to do go straight up and then back down and then uh, catch the enemy plane. Okay, here we are at our F-100, and it's got the, uh, the painting scheme of the Thunderbirds, which is the Air Force uh, display team. Now, if you notice all the silver paint there, it was peeling here a couple of years ago. I gave them Air Force razor blades, or bayonets. It was a single-edge razor blade. We scraped the whole plane. It took us like two months. The painter did it and repainted it in three hours. So we did a lot of prep work on it. Uh, two things of history on this. The F-100 is the first plane that actually flew to break the sound barrier flat. Most pilots would dive and break the sound barrier. That was cheating. This one here, and we saw the engine when we came out of the, uh, the museum. So this is, engine came from that one. The other history is that this came from Rantoul over at the Chanute Air Force Base which is just north of Champaign. They drove it here on a flatbed truck at 20 miles an hour. They would go any faster, it would start wanting to lift and take off flying. So a little bit of history. So it took them like four hours on the interstate to get it here. Big traffic jam, but uh, we got it here. Okay, most of the planes we just looked at uh, during open cockpit day, we cannot open the cockpit on those because we are under, under loan obligations to the Air Force and Navy museums. But we do have a few out here that we can open the cockpit and you can sit in. This is our T-33. Again, we got this one from University of Illinois who got it from Chinook. And last uh, summer, we just put the, air, the fuel drop tanks on it. But let's go ahead and go on up. Again, this sat uh, tarnished for many years. And over the last couple of years, we hand polished it to get the real shiny uh, look. But this one here, we open the cockpit and you can actually sit in it. So this is one of our true open cockpit where you can sit in. Kids love it. And so do adults, they're still kids. This is our Cessna 310. Ask your parents or probably your grandparents that they remember the Sky King movie back in the uh, early or late 50s. 
uh, Sky King and his daughter Penny. So this is a big TV show. I watched it as I when I was a kid. I'm 77, so I was back to that age. But uh, it was one of the uh, f favorite uh, Saturday movies for kids. And it's a four-seater. You can actually get inside it, pretend you're flying. And so again, this is open on our open cockpit days every third Saturday of the month, May through September. Why would they have a mirror on a plane? So the pilot can make sure the hair is all nice and, and uh, in place? No, if you take a look back here, okay, this is what they call an underwing. So the pilot could not see if his hydraulics was up or down, so with the wheels are up or down. So they would look out the window, check the mirror to see if their wheels are up or down. It's a little safety factor. The plane we have on display today, we still have three more in the hangar that are being prepped during the winter time, is our Aero Commander 680. Okay, a little history on this one. Eisenhower. This is the first Air Force One because the history was that they had the, they were on a flight in this type of plane and a commercial, they had the same tail number. So the control tower gave instructions and there was confusion. Air Force said after that, no more numbers. It's whenever the president is on a plane, it's always called Air Force One. So it started with this type of model. Dwight D. Eisenhower actually flew these planes. He was a pilot also. Wow, what a tour that was. Make sure you come check out this museum starting in April. It's only $5 to students and you get so much history and so much fun. And you can make a whole day out of it. Thank you so much for tuning in to What To Do.